Okay, so welcome back to another Battleborn Inductors podcast. Um, today's a little intro. We're gonna talk about our Ruby's duck hunt. Talk about Morgan Nelson that we brought out last year. He accompanied us on a Ruby's duck hunt, and we're also gonna talk about Ricardo Greer. He went first time duck hunting with us last year, and accompanied us on that Ruby's Mountain duck hunt. So that's what our podcast is gonna be about today. Is about that duck hunt and. Uh, Kind of Morgan and Ricardo's experience. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit, Morgan? Hi, I'm Morgan, and I got into duck hunting with uh, Ron Stoker last year. Had a blast, and now I'm pretty much hooked on it. So, dude, you're as awkward as I am, man. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You can talk about yourself if you want. Yeah, well, I'm Ricardo. Uh, I'm also a ladies' man. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll transpose whatever you're supposed to say. Um, I've been in the hunting majority of my life already, but I got into duck hunting last year with Ron when I started working uh, in some places in him, so. It's almost like my employees, like part of being like turnkey, you have to be like, well, you ready to go duck hunting? Yeah, if you want to be an employee at turnkey, you have to get your duck <laughs> license, so. Yeah, it's funny, before this podcast, uh, Morgan looks at me and he says, you know, I don't think I've ever seen you at a ca- outside of camel, because that's the only time <laughs> I've ever seen you is when I'm hunting with you, so. Uh, we got to spend a little bit of time with both of them on a couple of different hunts now, so it'll be kind of a good talk about the experience of this one. It was a little bit different than what we'd hoped for, but still a pretty good trip yeah. all in all. Yeah, so we went up to the, the Ruby Marshes, which is up in kind of northern Nevada, north northwest corner of Nevada, and uh, well, northeast, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah northeast, the yeah. sun goes in the east. Northeast corner of Nevada, and it's a huge wildlife preserve that is just a massive marsh. It is just a massive marshy maze. And uh, we, we, we thought it'd be super good up there, and uh, we ran into, a little, ran into a few little things that made it a little bit more difficult, but it was still a good hunt. I had a really good time. It's certainly the most challenging, some of the most challenging ducks I think we've ever been on up there they don't didn't act like your standard ducks they didn't decoy at all a lot of pass shooting on mallards and stuff like that and it just everything was super fast and nothing really came down everything stayed up high and we're ruby marsh is pretty notorious for opener of having 35 40 thousand ducks in the area and there just weren't the numbers up there it was 80s for a hot or for a high during the day and oh, we were short sleeving only it. got down into the 30s or 40s at night so the theory we have is the kind of the ducks haven't moved in yet and, and it was so i mean where we should have seen thousands of ducks we saw a couple hundred maybe the entire trip and only a couple I, only a few really shootable ducks i mean it was really limited on where we could take our shots and and get some harvest so now morning went out with me last year at the overton wma that was the first place he went out and hunted with me with and uh you've always mentioned something about like trying to get up and shoot quick and how difficult it is yeah, yeah, that's my thing is knowing when to shoot, what to shoot. Yeah. So I usually I hesitate until you give me the go ahead. So <laughs> I don't want to shoot the wrong bird. Is that, yeah, that was the delay. And those ducks at uh, Ruby's, man, they're coming just zooming across. And the shootable ducks were the ones that are kind of past shooting within range. And by the time you could call the shot, you know, you were a couple seconds behind me and Brian. Yeah. And uh, those ducks were kind of, uh, they're, they're, they're taking off. I just don't want to be that one guy that pokes his head out too soon and scares everything away. Have you guys swear at me or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian's going to swear at you anyway. <laughs> I'll swear anyway. Ron doesn't do so much swearing as I do, but you know, and that's the hard part. You get out with uh, duckers or duck hunters that don't have quite as much experience and it takes them a little bit longer to get up on ducks. And Ron and I usually try to give them an opportunity, but I mean, this was such a difficult hunt that you know, really, you had to be up and on those ducks as soon as you saw them almost. I mean, you get, when, when you saw the duck and had the opportunity to take a duck, you had a split second to be on that duck and take it before it was gone. I mean, they were full pass right across the front of us, no matter which way you turn. The problem with hunting a marsh of that size and with that many holes in it is the ducks always have somewhere to go. So if there's something that's just a little tiny bit off, they'll go find a safer hole. Yeah. And so anything that doesn't quite seem out of the order that maybe they flew by there yesterday and something changed, they're going to go find another hole. So we, you know, we, we found the ducks around. I were lucky enough to get up there Friday and scout a little bit and do some fishing and 
and we found found some ducks quite a few and found a couple spots we talked to some other hunters who were up there and they give us some suggestions on places we weren't really thinking about and that's where we ended up starting and you know you could see a few ducks but they would really pretty much go out to another hole that we just couldn't get a, get a shot in out of so we did get a couple um the first day and a couple of, you know the second day was a lot slower i mean yeah the duck hunters that hunt this area every single year for opener that are always a limit um they were coming back with four ducks i think one, one duck one duck the next day i mean so it was just a difficult opportunity now we heard a lot of shooting from an area that you know was up north of us it was a dike area which is all walk-in hunters so you know it may have been better up there i know there were parts of the area of that part of the state that people did fairly well in still but it just was a difficult hunt and it's i know for a, a newer hunter it can be frustrating for somebody that doesn't get a chance on a lot of ducks and you sit there in a blind for we 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 literally on saturday sat in the blind from 4 30 in the morning till seven o'clock at night so yeah. um it was a long long day on saturday for sure and then we hunted up at the ruby half a day on in the morning on on sunday and then ron and i went down to went Ely. down south on our way home to ely and hunted that a little bit and so now some of the things that was kind of cool about being out there and like kind of working as a team even having the new guys in the boat um, those marshes were so big that we had to and we used onyx maps to gps our way in we saved that map online before we took off um, when I was laying in bed at night, Brian was snoring. He snores like a grizzly bear, by the way. I could barely sleep. I couldn't I sleep. I didn't hear me snoring at all, so I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to what I did a little bit later in the tent. Nothing inappropriate. <laughs> but <laughs> so we, when I was laying there in bed, I tracked this map in, and so we had a few rolls on the boat. Brian and Ricardo. Brian was up front with the spotlight, making sure we didn't run into anything. I mean, we had the spotlights on the boats, but the spotlight on the side helped. Ricardo sat right behind me. What did you do? Well, I was sitting right in front of you. While you were right in front of me, yeah. And I was just had the map out, just telling them where to turn because you can get easily lost in those reeds, and sometimes you can't see the opening until you're right up on it. So until you're running into it. And so Ricardo, he he sat in front of me on the boat, and I couldn't hear well because that motor is pretty loud. And he'd just stick his hand out. And Brian would also stick his hand out, and I figured which ones looked the most right, and I I'd, I'd, I'd choose between the two. Now Morgan had a more of a tough job. He was the push pull man, and so yeah. <laughs> go ahead. You can tell me a little uh, about that. I just had to make sure we didn't get stuck, and then yeah, so I just had to push us in and out. Yeah, you're slamming through that marsh, and you can't really see anything because there's lots of duck feed and vegetation, and you can't tell if it's three feet, five yeah. feet, or one foot until you start slowing down. And it varied like pretty close. Like some areas, it'd be just like a few, like a really, you know, twelve inches. It'd be like six feet deep, and then. No, so it was quite the adventure. Too. Yeah, and well, so it's a tough place to get in to a new area, especially when it's dark out, because it is the reeds. You know, the map you get the aerial map, and you can kind of see where the channels and stuff are a little bit. The cool thing about it is there's some channel markers in the deep parts, but once you get out to where you're really going to want to hunt, there's nothing to guide you in and out. And some of the areas are literally you'll have an opening through the reeds either just barely wide enough to get your boat through or the reeds are just thin enough to pass through to the other side you can barely see through those reeds but you can't tell on that aerial view where those reeds have grown up and where they haven't so it really is that was one of the good things about ron and i kind of scouting a little bit in the morning or the, the on the friday before we came back sunday to hunt we kind of had an idea of where we were going to start with so it gave us a little bit of an advantage getting in saturday we got in it seemed like it's because forever to get out there just because it's such a difficult place to get through if you're not used to it so it was it was an adventure though i mean even though the ducks weren't flying it was my first time i'm sure some of our southern people have been been in marshes like that i was thinking about that i'm like this is this is super exotic from us because i where you grew up here in vegas too right yeah. you grew up in utah so high desert you grew up in vegas essentially and so we're used to rocks we're used to like you look out and you can see you know, 100 miles, and so when you're in a marsh and you can only see five feet in front of you and you don't know where the pond is the next thing, man, that scares us desert rats. We're not used to that much water. And something, when you're used to Utah, you have like mountain ranges you can see and be like, oh, that's west, that's north, but there I came to where we were at and where we were going. You know, yeah. that's one of, one of the things I think I was pretty memorable about this experience is Ron and I got there on Friday, we were out on the water doing some fishing and, and scouting and 
this older guy passes by and waves at us or whatever and we pull back into camp and he's got the first campsite and he had, it was in his duck boat so obviously he was doing a little fishing he was going to be up there duck hunting as well and so he yells at us on the way through hey what are you following me and so we stop by <laughs> and, and, and talk to the guy for a little bit and it old phil come, comes to find out old phil actually a buddy of ours last year went up and, and met old phil up there he's a 70 year old man um told us he gave told us a story about sinking his boat last year at opener and how he was having a hard time getting in he was paddling in because he sunk his motor and he everything. He was push pulling in, Yeah, man. he was push pulling in and somebody finally, a couple hours later, came and pulled him in and Ron and I, <laughs> Ron and I can't stand to see somebody struggle so we told him, well, he hey. He was all by himself too. If, if, you, uh, if you're not in when we get back, we'll, we'll help you in. And Matt started that friendship with that, with that gentleman and, and then some guys from across the way that were friends of his came over and later Saturday night we came back in and we were kind of talking to him and they were giving us some areas to try that they know that the ducks are normally flying and it's kind of their their migration route through there a little bit and then phil just was telling us i mean it was kind of nice to sit around and listen to some of the stories he had about places he hunted but it was kind of refreshing because typically what we get with duck hunters is nobody wants to be not good to anybody else and everybody is so protective over their little territory and our thing is we don't want to be on top of you hunting and that's nobody wants somebody right on top of them and when we told Phil where we were going to be hunting, he, we were talking about where we are going to hunt Sunday, and he goes, and I'm like, will you tell us where you're going to hunt, and we'll, we'll go somewhere else. He goes, I don't care. He goes, you guys can fish tw- or hunt 20 feet from me. I trust you guys, so we're good. So it was kind of a nice experience. And, man, he was, he was an honorary guy. I mean, he was, <laughs> certainly was opinion. He didn't, he didn't have a... <laughs> and there was no filter there. Yeah, no filter <laughs> at all. So, but it was, a, it was kind of an enjoyable experience to... to be able to get with hunters that actually want to make it a community. And his thing, like, like he told Ron and I, he goes, man, it's nice to see younger guys come out here and, and help grow the sport. And that's really what Ron and I are all about. We want to bring even the younger guys than us. So I'm in my 40s, I think Ron's still in his 30s. Um, but we're bringing some youth out quite a bit. And Can't tell with this baby face, man. Some the guys, yeah. <laughs> some of the younger guys out and, and have never experienced and, and get them into the duck hunting thing. And it, it's going to help grow the hunting sport. And it's going to help management areas and stuff like that grow because all of the fees that we're paying in to be hunters and to get our duck stamps and to get our hunting license, that all goes back to, to making it a better environment for us to be able to hunt. So, yeah. So what, what was the most least enjoyable part? I know you got one. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what it was. What happened to you? Uh, just uh, the first day when we were out there, we got ate up pretty good by some mosquitoes. And I must have stuck my hand in the water. And uh, I think I got my hand infected because the next day I woke up and the thing was just a balloon, man. <laughs> I couldn't move my fingers and we still had a whole day of you know, shooting ducks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the best, the best about that was on the way home. He was trying to text his girlfriend. He could have been <laughs> trying to see that kid text. I was with his fat fingers, man. It was, it well, was and, and I'll tell you, that was partly my fault. I, uh, I have a couple bags that I take with me, and some of it has some some a little bit warmer weather gear in it for when it's a little chilly out. My decoy gloves and stuff, and the other one keeps my thermocell and and some other things in it. Well, I grabbed the wrong bag in the morning, and so we didn't have our thermocell out there. I'll tell you. If you don't use a thermocell, I mean, you ought to look into them. They're only like 20 bucks. Wear gloves. <laughs> yeah, wear gloves. That, that's a good one. But they're only 20 bucks. I mean, the difference between Day and Saturday night. and Sunday was, was a total difference. In fact, Ron and I hunted, yeah, up on, hunted another lake on evening. Sunday afternoon. And there, were, I mean, the mosquitoes were so thick. It was, it was incredible. And you all can, you did with the thermocell. You take the thermocell up, and I picked it up. And I pick it up towards this whole mass of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes would move up with a the thermosel. Oh, they come down with a the thermosel. Yeah. You said that's only twenty bucks. It's only twenty bucks. Um, they have little last, filters you put in them. With the with the original pack you get with them, it's like twelve hours worth of time. But it's you know fifteen or sixteen bucks for the refill packs. But I mean to not get ate up by mosquitoes, it's 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 certainly worth it. I mean, there's some things that that you can do to make your experience a lot more enjoyable. And if you're not getting killed by mosquitoes, problem is. Usually by the time we get hunting, we get one or two weeks of mosquitoes, and it's over. Then, they're, then they're gone. This year, it's it's just it, we're setting record temperatures this year um, for September, and we're in October, and we're still hitting almost 100 degrees. So um, <clears throat> I think the mosquitoes are going to stick around for a little bit this year. Yeah. Um, 
I remember it was so thick that morning, I inhaled and started sucking some in. Yeah, they were big. You know, I might be a big mouth breather, but. <laughs> I mean, the, the poor dog, you look at it, look at, oh, at Rob, the dog, he's Rob. just covered in mosquitoes. And, yeah. and, and you know, so we, there's things we can do um, as hunters when we prepare to go out and make ourselves more comfortable. I mean, Ron and I are, Ron bought a waiter jacket last year and I made fun of him because he spent a lot of money on this waiter jacket. Well, I'm not spending three hundred dollars on a jacket, and you know, come close of the season, I found a pretty good deal on one, so I spent one hundred and fifty bucks on a waiter jacket. And and I was amazed I didn't do it before. I mean, it's just so much nicer to to be comfortable. Hunt off a boat for us is, is a lot more comfortable experience. Yeah, we kayaks a lot, but to be able to be up and out of the water is is, is kind of nice. Uh, to be able to have stuff with you. Uh, have, have some food with you and stuff like that. Ron and I are, are notorious if, if we don't have our limit, we don't want to come in, so we'll we'll sit on the lake from well, sunrise first to day, sundown. Well, so. that first day, we all rushed out there because we were worried about getting out there, and we all forgot all our food. Yeah. All we had is one water bottle between all of us. Yeah, we forgot a lot We of shared, stuff though. Day, we're family. We yeah. all shared. You know, you kind of, Ron and I's kind of thing is we just kind of, we'll tend to tough it out a little bit more, and, and I appreciate you two for for kind of going along with it. I know we'll have <laughs> yeah, dude, like, the, the best of, of circumstances, but it, yeah, we got to see some ducks and it was, it's a beautiful country up there. Um, you, you really do get to see a different, kind of a different- Part of Nevada. Yeah, part of Nevada, a different look. There's not a lot of marshland down south like that. And wow. like I said that the people that were around it wanted to be part of a duck hunting community was, was pretty impressive to see up there and the cool thing about it that marsh is so big that you know you would think there could be a ton of boats up there and, and mm -hmm. tons of people still, there's there you could still have your room i mean it, yeah. we hunt some places where no matter where you go you're gonna be right on top of somebody and it makes it a lot less enjoyable hunt because with the ruby marshes you could have somebody that maybe wasn't such an experienced hunter that really wasn't pushing your ducks, you know? Speaking of that, I had an interesting conversation today with a, one of the wildlife managers. We're putting goose boxes at his place. And uh, he said he's really worried about opener, you know. Um, it's one of the places up like uh, towards the Alamo area because there's, there's a couple lakes up there. And with all these wildfires, that's where they've taken all the water from. And so one of the lakes that are one of the major hunting ponds up there is empty. And so open up there, where they're usually able to get 55 guys on this preserve, now they're gonna fit 55 guys around one lake, and he's like, man, I hope someone doesn't get shot. You know, you know but the Ruby Marshes, you don't have that problem. You know, and that's the tough part is we've been, this has been a rough, a rough, rough year for us for wildfire. And, and a couple of areas that Ron and I like to hunt for ducks and stuff, I mean, they've, they've had a significant amount of fires this year. And, we were up around Ely and, and Ron and I hunted a little lake up around Ely last year for opener and it was a great hunt. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. That was actually Ricardo's first You went by that lake this year. What does it look like? Yeah, uh, it's empty, man. I drove by it earlier when I was up at home. I don't know if I knew it And we had a, an excellent hunt opening day last year there. And I mean, the, we got there Friday night and the geese were so thick, Ron and I couldn't sleep because they were so loud. So <laughs> That was crazy, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So you get those, if there's a change in the environment, Ron, I noticed that when we were up, uh, even when we were up doing our deer hunt with the boys and you know, that the sage was really tall because we had some early rain this year, but most of the water sources were really dry. I mean, there wasn't a lot of water running where there's normally water running. But the weird part was there's water where we wouldn't normally expect there to be water. So, yeah. so it's just, I, I think it's going to be a little bit challenging in the season. I hope the forecast holds up. Uh, we get some more water out there. I know the farmer's almanac is saying it's going to be a really cold winter this year, and so that hopefully yeah. that pushes some some more ducks down south. But they've got to be have a place to be. So if we've got a lot of dried up reservoirs, there's really not going to be a lot of place for them. To be. They're just going to kind of push through until they find something. So well, let's talk about all the bloopers that I did while I was up there. So first thing in the morning, man, I had to embrace that suck because I dug that big hole to try to get that that motor and that boat and those reeds. We, Brian, it's either Brian or Morgan nails one, bop, drops in. So I get out with my dog. He's a newer dog, so he doesn't know how to get straight on him. So I'm kind of showing where there's that. And I step out on the boat to go show him, and there's a hole. And I can <laughs> oh, yeah. see it underneath the water. So I went swimming. 
<laughs> Good thing we're swimming and baptize my gun. Time, but, yeah. <laughs> it was 13 degrees. Yeah, the first duck you got your toe in, yeah. Yeah, so we took off that sweater and then later that day a duck popped by and threw that sweater back in the water. <laughs> <laughs> he jumped on the duck, so we had his sweater kind of up on our, on our blind cover. and To dry and off, yeah. To dry it off and he stands up. To do, I don't know if it was a duck come by, I can't remember what exactly what it was, but he jumps up and pops that blind cover up and then he comes and sits down and goes, well, I think my sweater's wet now. <laughs> he pulls the sweater up out of, out of the lake and it's just dripping <laughs> water. And, you know, yeah. so Ron got to spend the rest of his day. It was even worse because that was the day we didn't have the thermosel too. And so those mosquitoes just had a feast, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was sleeping like this and I like woke up and my whole arm, I could still feel them, all the bites on there. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, I mean, it, it was still, I mean, with all the stuff that went on, and that was, that was only the first half of the hunt. The second <laughs> half of the hunt, we're coming out of, uh, Coming out of re the reeds, we closed out. We got a couple of birds, and we're we're going home. It's it's sunset, and you know we're gonna pack everything back in the boat and head back back home to see our wives and stuff. And we're digging in those reeds hard. Digging in those reeds hard, and all of a sudden the the boat kind of acted like it was was stuck. And sometimes when we're in one of those reeds, we can shake the boat back and forth a little bit, and it'll pop us loose. We'll pull right through. So I start shaking it back and forth a little bit, and runs like, hold on, hold on. I look back, and the motor's laying on its side. <laughs> it had come off, and luckily it just picked sideways in the boat, and so we had to yeah. put the motor back on, tighten it back down, and you know we got on the lake. It was probably Ron and I were debating whether we were gonna get it on the water, but there's so many ducks <clears> on the water. That's just a good, that's an experience thing because we went. I mean, that uh, driver to the Rubies with the motor on the back of the boat down that bump. We took the bumpy road out, and how how many miles was that? You drove that road out. Was yeah. it like a hundred miles? Yeah, I think it was. It's like a two-hour ride from the marsh to the main road. Yeah. And so it's this big old long road and like it, it makes sense those bolts are going to rattle loose a little bit. We should have checked them, but now we will. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm just glad we didn't dump it in the middle of the lake and the push pedal back like Phil. Well, you know, Ron and I were just mm -hmm. talking probably a couple weeks ago about or an episode of Dr. Duck podcast. It was, you know, they, they were filming, so they filmed for, for uh, Reels Free Outdoors and they go to go hunting and they get to where they're going and they got back to the house, I think, and they look at the boat and there's no motor there. So they dropped the motor off on the highway. So <laughs> <laughs> so they completely lost their motor. Um, we talk about sometimes, sometimes guys just on our side. We were in five foot of water at that, that area. So that boat, if that motor had come off into the water, man, it would have been a chore to get it up and we would have got it, get it back on. But we would have got it. But it wouldn't have been a fun. It would have sucked. It wouldn't have been a fun I'd have night. gone swimming to get that motor out. You no, know, but we just, we started that part of the hunt. It was, we took a couple hour drive uh, back up, back down south a little bit to get into Ely. And we get there and there's, there's some ducks on the water. There's a ton of coots. There's some ducks mixed in with the coots. And we get back to where, you know, of course you're driving back in to get into the marsh area back there and, and you're spooking the ducks up off the water. But Ron and I are sitting there staring at the water and we're trying to debate. So it's about 20 mile an hour winds. We're running a 17 foot John boat with a mud motor. And we're it's like, white capping well, out there. Let's drive down there and see if it looks any better. And so finally, Ron and I, and we knew what the answer was, but Ron and I just said, well, we got to send it. There's too many ducks. So, yeah. so we got out on the water, man. We got past the one reed line and it calmed down a little bit. And it was it actually wasn't. In our defense, hunt. we did look up the weather and saw that the wind was going to calm yeah, down we, a little we bit looked later. The weather, I mean, and we looked at, okay, well, we can get out there and then the weather should change a little bit. We should slow down to where it was. We'll reasonable. stay by the shallows. We, we had, we had an out. If we, worst comes to worst, we could have always just beach the boat and slept on the car for the night and then taken the boat back. But you know, it was a, it was kind of a nice hunt. I mean, we didn't, you get in there, I think we got in there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was so. more of a scouting hunt because we didn't know the area, it's, it, so we scouted it a little bit. We flew around the lake, jumped all the birds. Yeah. And a key to getting out there early is getting out there early and set up and not letting them know you're there. Yeah, you got to give them chance. you got to give them time to get back in. And then we call a buddy of ours because he's hunted that. We thought he hunted a lot more than he'd hunted. Apparently, he's hunted it once. So we call him and, and say, hey, you know, where do you think we should go? Because um, if we can pick somebody's brain and kind of get a, a general area where, where it would be a good place and he gave us kind of a general part of the lake that, that he would go if he was going there and then he's like well is there a lot of people out there I'm like no we're the only ones on the lake and he goes it's probably because it's close <laughs> and so right then Ron and I luckily we're in, we have cell phone service out at that particular day Ron and I are both on our phones looking at okay what are the regulations out yeah. here because 
But we looked at the regulations we before, have, so, but once he made us paranoid. Yeah, and, and so he made us paranoid, and he kind of laughs, and we're like, well, you know, is it usually good? He goes, I don't know. He goes, I've only been there once, and we limited out, so I don't know why we haven't been back. So it's because it's a drive into there. It is. A, it is a drive, but it was a. It was a nice hunt. I think we'll do it again. Um, we're debating yeah. kind of where we have another opener coming up before we have a southern opener. So we have kind of an intermediate opener that comes in, and we're kind of debating where we want to go. And we may go up there instead. We're not quite sure, but you know, I think. What do you guys think of the overall? Jimmy. compared to your last one because both of you had a little bit different experience you were in a stationary blind you were out at, at um morgan has done the, morgan's done stationary kayak and now boat oh yeah that's right because morgan got lost in the uh the, the prince yeah, yeah, first go ahead. yeah you tell that story that's a good story well that was, that was a pranagate right yeah we were just out of the pranagate and it's like you know before the sun i couldn't like it was really dark you guys had your headlamps on, you guys take off in your kayaks, and I had that little kid one. That was all loaded down, and you guys just took off. I could, you know, you took off across the lake about the time I was like in the middle of the lake. I couldn't even see your headlights anymore in the reeds. I'm like, so I kind of headed towards where I thought you were going. And I guess I headed the other direction. And, you know, I got in the spot where the lake was frozen over, I was breaking through ice. I'm like, all right, well, I guess if I can't find them, I'll just set up in some reeds and <laughs> make the best of it. Did you have a headlamp on when you were out there? Yeah, yeah. So me and Brian, on the other end of that story, we're over. <laughs> I, I, I usually take off fast and I get the spot. Brian falls behind to make sure every, everybody can keep up. And so I take off fast, I get to the spot, I get all our decoys set up, and Brian's pulled in, he's setting up some decoys, and I go, hey, where's Morgan at? He goes, he was behind me. And I go, okay. And so we're sitting out there a little bit longer, all the decoys are set up, we're pushing the reeds. I said, I hope he didn't die. Now, <laughs> so, now, we're, now we're worried. Now we're, now we're worried because it's been a minute. So I started doing the, well, I better get back in my kayak and backtrack. And I backtrack and go, Morgan. He goes, I'm right here. <laughs> and like, I couldn't see him. It was just like total pitch darkness. And there's this kid that's yelling out the reason, I'm right here. <laughs> uh, it's hard because you're kayaking out. It, you know, it's, it's dark. And I can see where you, it, it's kind of, you can kind of lose a headlamp fairly easy. But we, yeah, we, when we're kayaking, we have so much stuff on our boats that, you know, we have well a bag of decoys or two on on our boats, mm -hmm. and then I think Morgan had a bag of a, a bag of decoys, and we'll have you know you gotta have your shells, and I'll, I'll usually carry a dry bag with shells and some snacks and guns, heater, extra, extra gloves and stuff, stuff like that. So if you're when you get cold in that water, because it, and Morgan said it was frozen over, so we we're having to break through ice and stuff, and so you don't really have. The ability to turn around a whole lot to see what's behind you so you're just kind of like, oh they should be keeping up and i can hear them behind me we're halfway across the lake i can hear them behind me and i get over there and i was like where's morgan i'm like well it's behind like, me i was scared of being too loud i didn't want to like piss off any other hunters or anything so i'm like well i'll just keep trugging along until i'm sure they'll come looking for me or something or i hear guns or something you know? <laughs> well i think that's a big thing to be worried about if especially if you're an inexperienced hunter in a discipline, maybe not even necessarily an experienced hunter, but maybe an inexperienced duck hunter or a deer hunter or whatever, is it's trying to not affect other people's hunts as much as possible. If you can come in and, and a big thing for Ron and I is we'll tell you when to take ducks. Ricardo got a, got a lesson on that when, when we went on our first hunt. We don't got to talk about but, that. But we'll tell you, we'll, we'll tell you when to take ducks. He didn't ducks. do anything illegal. Exactly, but we'll tell you when to take the back shot and make the call. <laughs> but if you don't, then it kind of affects everybody else's hunt. And so, if we can, if there's one thing that we can teach is, hey man, this is why we don't shoot when it's too when we're too high, or if you got somebody close to you and there's birds working on a, a group of birds working somebody next to you, you kind of let those guys work those birds before you take a shot, and, and just be good to other hunters. And I think when you do that you earn those respect points and it's people will want you back in their blind and they'll want you to come out with them and hunt and, and it, it, it helps a lot for becoming a better hunter because when you're out and you've earned those those like uh i don't know what you want to call them but they're your respect points kind of but then <clears throat> you get those guys numbers and they'll be hunting somewhere you'll be hunting somewhere you'll be texting back and forth whereas if you're uh you know an asshole they're not going to say anything to you well, you know but if you have the points you could call them up you could say hey listen this is how I'm doing here. How are you doing there? We're doing okay. This is what we're doing here. You know you can get honest answers. Whereas 
if you like, if you want to fight everybody, there's no use. There's no reason to fight. No, and what Ron and I'll set up if we're certain places and we know some of the guys that are there, kind of try to set up to where we can advantageously kind of push ducks. If there's ducks coming into us and we take shots, it's going to push them towards towards them a little bit. And it's really Ron and I play the, the checkerboard game a lot of times. We go out hunting. And we kind of if it's assigned blinds, we'll see kind of where everybody's at and then then decide whether we where we want to be and you kind of align yourself with the hunters that you know you can trust and you know you, you kind of know if there's certain hunters that you're going to have a tough day and, and nobody wants to go out and hunt and, and be working birds and then have everybody blow their birds out of their uh, out of their decoys and stuff it's just it makes it a frustrating hunt and it, it makes it not as enjoyable so it's almost kind of like michael jordan you know when he first started his career he didn't pass at all and he kept on losing you know that's a lot like duck hunting. If you if you if you pass on ducks, everybody gets to shoot. But if you don't pass on ducks, everybody loses. Well, that's I mean you could do the same thing with LeBron James. I mean, how many teams has he been with, and he can't win a can't win a championship, right? <laughs> oh. And it's it's it's. I don't long. think LeBron's gonna go hunting with you now. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm worried about LeBron going hunting with me, but <laughs> but you've got to everybody's got to work together, and the more we work together, and, and it comes down to not only duck season and being in blinds together but it comes down to off season what are you doing the off season to make it better for other hunters do you go out and help with some of these projects to make the wmas a little bit better do you get in with the wa wma managers and talk to those guys see what they need see what's going to make it a better management area there's a lot of things we can do as hunters to make our success a lot a lot easier so if we're building up you know areas i mean over this is a perfect example i know We've had several groups go in there and build some blinds. We've had some guys come in there with duck boxes and goose boxes. We're doing goose boxes for another WMA. Um, there's a lot of things we can do as hunters that maybe don't cost you personally money. Maybe it's getting out with a club and, and using some of that club's money and and building these projects or planting uh, millet. Sweat equity. It, it is a sweat equity, and I and it pays off for you, but it also pays off for every other hunter that's going to go in that blind. When you're not there. Yeah. Now, someone that's given a lot of sweat equity is Ricardo. You've helped us out on a few wildlife projects. What have you done with us? You brought um, donuts. <laughs> I've done it to a project. Yeah. You guys done a few projects a couple times. You did that one, and you're a big help. Tell us, tell us about when you pulled that pipe up that hill. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just went up and hauled some pipe up the mountain, and it was just... No, man, we tied you that pipe like a horse. <laughs> And you and drag it tied you and your brothers that pipe like a horse, and I was I was the fattest horse on that pipe, but <laughs> we just we, we we cracked it right up that hill, man. That was would we jump up like probably 500 feet in elevation? No, it was more than that. You're probably pushing a thousand feet. I'd imagine. How heavy was that pipe? It's 400 400 pounds probably. Yeah, and here's Ricardo tied to it. Just, yeah, we had some, some kids, Ricardo and Ron, all tied to the pipe, dragging up the hill. Calling it up, man. Poor, you poor, want to see the video? Go on Ron's TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poor Ricardo. I mean, he, anytime he gets gets around me, I, I give Ricardo a pretty hard time, and it's I didn't realize it was his parents at the time. And his parents look pretty young, so I'm making fun of Ricardo and, and just razzing him like I normally do. And, and these two people are just laughing, so I think they're friends with him. I'm gonna find out his parents were laughing at him more than I was laughing at him. So are your parents not your friends? Nah, I think I'm a joke, man. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, something different from this year from last year. This year it was really warm. How, how was your hunt last year starting out, man? Oh man, um, when I went duck hunting the first time, I I made the mistake of not bringing you know warm weather, <laughs> yeah, or warm gear, because I, I was out there the week before and it was. Short sleeving it. Yeah, it wasn't. We were short sleeving it. We we're hunting antelope, and it wasn't that cold. I go on out the next weekend, and I'm shivering in a blind. You know, it, it literally went from lows in the 40s. We were up the week before, as well. Ron and I were we were hunting uh, deer with the kids that year. We had yeah. some more youth tags, and it was in the 40s in the morning. So Ron and I get out there that night, and it was a, it was a little cool, but it wasn't bad. We get up in the morning, it was 17 degrees. We paddled across this lake. Frozen. Until we got to the other side, everything on the boat was frozen. Yeah, I remember so. our paddles had ice on them, like the boat had ice on them, and we were all we had some extra clothes, and so you were, we were bundled up pretty good. But it was still another thing that Brian turned me on to. Uh, every single time we go out now, we have them hot hands, and you put them in your pockets, and you know you get your hands warm, and you throw the decoy, and you put your hands back in there. You know the other one that uh, I a couple years ago I just we were at 
there's a little gas station we stop at pretty much every time we go through going to some of our duck hunting areas and I grabbed some of the foot warmer and, and threw my boots because on kayaks we're we're in the water 90 you're shooting of out time. of the water hit the we're in the water and it's you know it can be 12 degrees out 17 degrees 20 is warm in the, in the morning and so your feet are gonna get gonna get cold those i put those in and my feet are not we're, we're never cold after that point but you know i think that's that's a good thing it, it's it's a a good thing to to know what your gear is and what the capabilities of it and have good gear i mean I, Ron doesn't wear sunglasses a whole lot, so yeah. I, I always pretty much have sunglasses on, and man, I, I was, I use just about every brand of, sun, of premium sunglasses there were, and, and we have a company out by us, Beck Sunglasses, and um, I went in there one day and, and tried on a pair of those sunglasses, and man, those are the best sunglasses I've ever owned, and I, and I don't wear anything else, and they, they treat us right, um, they do really good by our community, and, and Donate to, other a lot charity of, to a lot still. of charity groups. My my youth groups. I mean, anytime I ask Jason and, and Haley for for anything, they're they're more than willing to step up. If if you haven't tried um, a pair of Beck sunglasses on or seen a pair of Beck sunglasses, they're designed to be worn under hats. Um, they're they're just an excellent product and they're, and they're reasonably priced and they stand behind their product. They're made so, for the outdoor man. Yeah, um, Bex.com. Get on on Bex.com. Bex and it's not. They're not an international conglomerate like you get with these big sunglass companies. They're literally it's a small town company on, on a ranch in Logandale, and they they hire people from the area and and they source all their product. They they've got a one line that's specifically U.S. made and some they got good that clothes they too. Source everywhere else. They have awesome hats and and t-shirts and uh, it was a Western lifestyle brand pretty much, but he's kind of transitioned into some of the sportsman stuff as well so tell him what he did this year with that uh he started losing some followers because he liked trump yeah so um he, he's kind of like ron and i and, and actually ricardo morgan we're all actually um lds and so he got on his his facebook page and started talking about around christmas time about his belief in god and then Right after that, he started talking about Trump was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he said <laughs> it was a really great promotion. And, and man, the guy's a promotional genius. So he got on his TikTok and said, "Look, I've lost," or on his Facebook, I'm sorry, he said, "Look, I've lost some followers because I support Trump." But here's what I'm gonna do, and he goes, "I've been talking about God and Trump, and anybody, the first five thousand people that, that commented on his post, he sent him a brand new Bex hat and a one dollar bill." With and he highlighted in God we trust on the one dollar bill, and so he sent out five thousand dollars in cash, and then another problem. Well, that costs is merchandise. Yeah. Like he sells his hats for pretty relatively cheap, but I mean, a hat costs like ten bucks to make. Yeah, and he what what the thing about Jason is with with his brand is he really so goes like out of his way to fifty-five thousand dollars to source quality. Yeah, he sources quality products, and so it takes him a long time. He said hats were the hardest thing on. I uh, listened to Jason's podcast behind the sun. Behind the Shades, I think it is, with Jason mm -hmm. Adams. Um, and he was talking about how hard it was for him to source hats because either the hats were so ridiculously expensive that it didn't make sense or that they were low quality. So him, he went to every place he could find before he finally found the hat that was kind of the mix of great quality and, and, and a reasonable price. We're going to have Jason on um, one of our podcasts hopefully here soon and talk with him a little bit. But... Yeah, I mean, we tend to like to support the guys that are supporting our community, and and it's great. I mean, it gives us the opportunity and these kids the opportunity. Jason gives prizes to kids for shooting events and stuff like that. And yeah, good. It's a good company. It is. So if you get a chance, hit them up on, online. They're on Facebook, Instagram. Um, they got a good online anywhere. shop presence. His new line just, just hit... I think he just got it in yesterday, if I remember right. So BX, Bex. Bex, and you, you won't... You won't you won't go wrong with them, so. Yeah, hey, uh, we got another story about you, don't we? Like, uh, you, uh, you got you got some shots on some ducks me and Brian missed. Not not the one, not the one early in the morning, but later in the day when we were up there to that first season. What were me and Brian doing? Oh, you sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was late morning. Uh, it was, it was early afternoon, it was around yeah, two o'clock. It was early afternoon. So ducks weren't really flying. Um, when it gets warm like that, we just don't get a lot of ducks up. They'll come in late, late, 
might, you might catch a single or a double. Yeah, you, but the last hour is when you really are going to have, last hour shooting lights, when you're really going to have a duck kind of coming in and <laughs> Ron and I kind of, we took a nap. We're like, we're going to take a nap. We've been up and we hunt hard. I mean, yeah, if we're up at 3 a.m. and you know, you're going to bed at 7, 9 o'clock, you're getting up at 3 the next morning, you, you run on empty. And so we tend to take a nap. Well, we will take a nap anywhere. Oh, Brian can't sleep in the boat. I can sleep in the boat. Ronald, Ronald will push everything out of the way, lay on the floor of the boat, and just pass out. And I, like, I, I just can't. Hey, listen, man, I called ducks in my sleep, though. I did that a couple times. Y'all jumped up. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, it, it was pretty funny. So, Ron, I mean, he's out. He's got sweatshirt over his head, the whole day. He is out like a light. Snoring, man. I was like snoring. That, that canopy thing in his head. He sits bolt up, right? He goes, Do you hear those teal? Do you hear those teal? And we're like, Dude, there was no sound whatsoever. But this was after he woke up at, in the middle of the night, and he goes, Oh, we're late. The sun's coming out. The sun's coming out. I'm looking at, I'm in the tent. I'm like, it's pitch black out. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, did you not set your alarm? I'm like, what time is it, Ronnie? He goes, it, it's 12.40. Go back to sleep. <laughs> hey, listen, I get a little excited, man. Hey, but look, when I called that ring, when I called that pintail in my sleep, y'all jumped up. So yeah. Y'all trusted yeah, me. All, all, <laughs> got him. So, so, oh, man. So, Ron and I woke up. It was, it was pretty funny. So, Ricardo sees this bird coming across and... I don't remember, it was a teal or something like that coming across. It was a flock about three teal coming And in. so, Ricardo takes his first shot on the ducks. Ron and I come out of a dead sleep set up and just start shooting. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we saw the ducks before we started we did. shooting. Though. We didn't see the ducks before we started shooting, but I mean, it was like, it was, as soon as we heard that first shot, we were back, we were right on the ducks, so. It, <laughs> But Ricardo was, Ricardo was the man, man. He was yeah. watching those guys. He, we wouldn't have known. They'd have been laying in our decos when we woke up. It was my first time hunting, and I was a little hesitant because I, I depend on these guys to tell me when to shoot, you know, because yeah. it's hard for our first time hunters to tell me when to find at. the ducks. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, another story to go along with uh, that first hunt. You know, there was a, a flock that just flew in, and they we, we, we were shooting at them, and one of them decided to stay, but it wasn't a legal bird, and I... I thought I could get a shot off at him. Good thing I missed, but <laughs> Ron, and I, Ron and I were sitting there. We're sitting in this, sitting in, our, in the reeds because we were kayak hunting. We're sitting back, tucked in the reeds, and so we'd taken a couple ducks out of this flock that came in. It was about a, a flock of ten tail bird. It's a comrade or something like that sitting in the middle of these decoys. After we shot, he flew right in. After we he shot, he dropped down after we shot. Yeah, I mean, literally, they hit. We had just finished shooting like a second or two before. He comes in. Lands in the decoys and stands there, and all of a sudden we hear, boom! <laughs> and we're like, no! We, we yell at Ricardo. And, no, 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 no! So, Ricardo, I'm like, I look at Ricardo, I'm like, thank God you're a bad shot. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, Ricardo learned that there's a reason we wanted to wait for us to call, and, and it's a there's an art. So, you get so excited, I think, your first time hunting. That was your first group of shots, too, right? Yeah. On ducks? Yeah. And, and I think what happens is, and I've noticed, Ron, the, the more I hunt, the easier it is to identify what duck's what, right? Yeah. So you can start to identify the mallards from the pintail. pintail from the widgeon or the canvas backs, you know? So it gets easier with time, and I think that first time hunter, they just, they're so focused in on wanting to shoot a duck that they see a bird flying and that's what they want to get. So as, as, Mentors, we got to be very careful when we take people out that we, we make sure that Dude, they're not coaching. shooting and stuff that's going to get them in trouble. I don't know. You have both ways. Like Ricardo's very driven. He has a he has a quick shot on the ducks. Whereas Morgan, he's a little bit you're, you're about my age, and so he he takes a little time and he'll wait and he'll miss shots sometimes because he'll wait to make sure he's like oh, I don't want to shoot something I'm not supposed to. Yeah, you no, know? it's a and that's one of the big things. The last thing you want a new hunter to do is take him out and. Then, Get him a big fat ticket from from old green jeans. Uh, you, if you're the guy taking him out, you better claim that ticket. Yeah, that's the that's the way I feel like. If you're taking someone out mentoring, and they do something wrong, and the old green jean gets up there, and you know, or you go talk to old green jeans. Either way, the GW, you know, you, you as the mentor, you should take the heat for that. And that's what I think you should at least. I, I mean, I'm not sure everybody else is. I guess it depends how many points you got already, Brian. <laughs> Points, you so know, if you're three away from no hunt anymore, you call me, I'll come down and take the points but, for you, you know? But no, you know, and that's the part of the thing is we have to, as hunters, I know a lot of people, old green jeans, the game warden comes in and, and man, people are just super nervous to see him and and they all hate the game warden. I think the game warden can be one of your best friends because the game warden 
can put you on birds. Everybody hates the ref, man. Yeah, everybody hates <laughs> the ref, but man, they can they can sure help you out a lot too. So you build those relationships up with the game wardens, the management area managers and staff. Yeah. You know, when you're having a tough time, sometimes that's what you need to get on the birds. And so you can talk to them and say, hey, Ron's made phone calls up to certain people and say, hey, are there birds in this week? Or, hey, is the water open now? Yeah, is the Good. water open? It, you know, can we get up there and get in or, or are we going to be iced out? So, you know, it, if you work on building those relationships, I know we all worry about we made a mistake and we get a ticket or whatever from the game board. But my experience is they're not there really just to, to harass people. They're trying to protect the environment. You get to every once in a while. That those are, game wardens, they have hunter's etiquette. They'll wait to come out to your blind until the birds are done flying. And yeah. that's when they come out and check on you. I mean, that they don't have to do that. There's nothing lost as you have to wait till the birds aren't flying to come out. No. I mean, we, we had a uh, game warden come up to us, actually or come up into our camp Friday night on this trip. And, you know, nothing was open yet. We'd fished that morning that day and did pretty well on some bass and run kind of decent rainbow. And, and uh, Ron goes to him, hey, we got this boat out here, so if you, if you have anybody that gets in trouble, you know, we'll come out and help you out. And so, Holler at us, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think those guys have limited resources, and you got to realize that... They're every, wild west in it, man. Yeah, everybody that they face has got guns, guaranteed. I mean, it's a... They're usually friendly guns, but yeah, they yeah, all have guns. Yeah, but they all have guns, so, and you never know what's, what you're coming across, because... Just because we're out hunters, those, that same area that we want to use as hunters are the same things that the people that don't want to be messed with are using that aren't hunters and maybe don't have the best motives. So I'm gonna take my Instagram pictures. So I think uh, we we can all. <laughs> I had a kid from Carl get taking Instagram pictures all the out there. Yeah, we can all do um, <laughs> do our part. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, Ricardo was the photographer, Ron, so. Hey, uh, I had something else. Ricardo did something cool. So I took Ricardo out on his first hunt. He took me on one of my first hunts. We went out dove hunting, and I've never decoyed over doves. And Ricardo had all the decoys, and that was really cool. We uh, <clears throat> we shot one. We had my dog in the blind with us, and that was cool. A double came in, and Ricardo drops the first one. Bop. Then I dropped the second one. That dog landed right into that dog's mouth, man. Yeah. Like I can't make it awesome. up. It was it was awesome, and we almost got it on camera, but it wasn't recording. So See, that's kind of <laughs> it's kind of cool when you can get a group of people. I think one of my fondest memories of duck hunting was actually sitting in a blind and over to with my son, and you know, birds come in, and and we both drop drop ducks at the same time, and it's pretty cool to be able to take somebody out, and especially when you have your kid in the blind with you, and and you can drop drop birds at the same time. Right after run hunting, none of us. Neither said ever really gone dove hunting. It wasn't just something. It's just it's too close to duck season, yeah. and you want to get all your stuff ready, and you're trying to get ready for deer hunts, and it's hot outside, and yeah, especially like, where we're at, it's, it's still 110 degrees during the afternoon, and usually the dove are blown off by the monsoons. But uh, you know, I actually, I didn't. I enjoyed the duck hunting, uh, and, and duck was just, I mean, duck was pretty good to eat, or not duck, duck. The dove, yeah. The dove hunting, and the dove, dove pretty good eating. I mean, it's a really super tender meat. And but it was hot, man. It was hot. It was really hot. It was hot by nine o'clock uh. in the morning. You're done for <laughs> sure. So, but I know there's, you know, Arizona's got a ton of it around us. And yeah. Ron and I actually learned about some new, uh, duck hunting's all in the AC, w man. Days. Yeah. It's all in the AC, <laughs> except for when you go up to the rubies in the middle of October or September yeah. and there's no AC out there at that point, apparently this year, but we, I mean, we're, and it just, goes to show sometimes everything should line up perfect but sometimes it doesn't a couple of years ago they had a foot of snow in the same exact area and that old phil said he's driving through a blizzard yeah usually it's in the teens in the in the morning up there at this time of year and it just so happened it's still a little bit warm and and just things happen but you make adjustments so a few learning things like the, some takeaways from the rubies things i learned that i wish i would know before i went out there one have the thermocell Two, um, you don't need a fancy GPS. I went to go buy one at the store. Uh, my buddy, Eric Payne, he talked me out of it. He said, hey, listen, you could download the offline Onyx maps and it'll get you right where you need to go, but bring a battery. Worked great, he was right. Third, the Ruby Marshes open at two, two hours before shooting light. So you have to be down there two hours before shooting light. And um, third on the Ruby Marshes, you're only allowed to have a 10 horsepower motor. Yes. And so those were the like at the takeaways, like I didn't know that. So those were the three takeaways or four takeaways I learned from the Ruby Marshes. Well, the sad, part is, sad part is we actually tried to put all our ducks in a row before we left. So Ron made 
several phone calls trying to get information out of some people and it just they weren't real helpful and it was even it, it was even some people associated with the management area and trying to call up her and say hey you know what do we need what and, and the answer he got wasn't a very good one <laughs> i'll give you the guy answer hey are there, are there gonna be how the campgrounds look are they pretty full up there this time of year sometimes well, like yes or no, like are they full right now? And then I was like, hey, listen, are there anything I should know about the lake or any rules or anything? He's like, nope. <laughs> and so like, it's way different. I taught these other WMAs and they're a wealth of knowledge. I mean, they're not gonna give you the X's, but they'll, they'll say, hey, look for this, do this. This is the kind of birds up here. But I called Russ from Endow. Russ, um, can't remember his last name, but he's the biologist in Nevada. And he helped me out a lot, but the, the WMA, who was working that front desk up there, man, they weren't so friendly. Well, that goes to show what building relationships will do, because I think Russ is probably one of your contacts from doing wind projects and stuff like that. Yeah, he's one of my inside guys. And, and then the other thing is, we got up there and, and Phil, the, the gentleman, I mean, he's 70 years old, he just turned 70 years old this year, he's had, so he had like four heart attacks, which doesn't surprise me because he smokes like 12 packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, but he's, he's a chimney man. But uh, he actually talked to us when we come by the, the one time and he actually told us what all the rules of the management area were that were specific to that management area and, and said, hey, this is what's, what they're going to be looking for, this is that. And so we were prepared now to, to, to be able to kind of go along with those rules where if nobody would have told us, we could have got, got hit by some of those rules. Yeah. We had no idea about like We didn't so. know it was two hours before. Exactly. You know, like, this, he, he kept us on track. He said, I'm going to be down here this time. I'll, you know, I'll get you all squared away. Anything you took away? Anything you'd do different if you went up there? Anything you learned? Um, well, since I'm kind of new, I just kind of mooch off all your stuff. So, uh, fair enough. But, but um, I learned stuff that I probably needed to you know, start saving up for and getting to make it nicer. But I think... You guys were pretty well over prepared, like for every situation. I think so. <laughs> no, we weren't. I didn't have a thermosol here. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brian is man. He had that like Carl's hands all swollen up. Brian's like, look, let me see what I have in my doctor kit. I guess it didn't affect me the mosquitoes because I, I was pretty covered, but well, yeah. except for gloves. Maybe I'll bring gloves next time. But yeah, no, but I, you know. And, and you know, I mean, duck hunting's an expensive sport. Don't don't get me wrong, but you don't have to go out and buy the best of everything and. Ron and I, are, we go out and buy a couple new toys every year to see if this works or that works, and you know, it's spending money, but I mean, basic camo will, will do pretty well. Small set of decoys. You know, you can get a t-shirt at, at Bass Pro or Sportsman's. At, or Walmart. Or, or Walmart that'll or work. Walmart. Thrift stores, you can get a bunch Thrift of stores, yeah. You know, the other thing is, you know, look, if you can get to an off-season, look for off-season. I buy my waders. I pretty much buy a new pair of waders every year. Black Friday. Black Friday. Sportsman's. Sportsman's Warehouse. They're like a hundred <laughs> bucks. <laughs> and you know, those will last me at least a season. My son's wearing my ones from last season um, because he happens to have the same size footage. So you don't have to, to go out and go out and buy Sitka gear and all this other stuff. You can be just as successful doing it a little bit more on a budget. Now I would say- you I guarantee should, you the ducks like Sitka more. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I called them up on the telephone. And, and you know, <laughs> I have I have a set of decoys that I actually bought. I, I was a desert <laughs> industry thrift store, and I bought a set, a set of decoys there that, you know, if there's not a lot of wind, they're a great set of decoys, and especially early season because they're a little bit more faded, but they're a packable set of decoys that are super light. So any little bit of wind, you get a lot of movement out of those decoys. Ron's got a really nice set of decoys. You know, he's got some Dakota decoys. I've got some Dakota problems with what I got. Dealer, but you know, I think you can you can make what you got <clears throat> work. Um, you don't have to go break the bank, and you know, you don't have to go out and buy a twenty five hundred dollar shotgun to go out and shoot a pump. An eight seventy pump will work just fine. Yeah. yeah. You you take anything away from this trip, man? Uh, just doing your homework, um, being prepared. You know, being comfortable plays a huge role in yeah, having uh -huh. a successful and enjoyable hunt. So yeah, there's no for next time. I think like having a good attitude, no matter what, just choose, you know, because you know you choose to go out there and you don't want to ruin it for anybody else. You know it's gonna suck sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, so you, you know. fell down too, huh? Oh, no. me and you both went yeah, swimming. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was towards the end of the night. So like I had to take off my sweater on the way back, and it got really cold. But. And that's kind of he didn't complain at all though, man. Ron and I, Ron and I say all along, you know, if you don't like being miserable, you don't like being a duck yeah. hunter, and because. 
part of duck hunting is going to be a miserable thing. But you're going to fall in the water. You're going to get wet. Hunting. Motor's going to fall off the boat. You're going to sink the boat. Motor, exactly. everything's going to get wet. We're somebody posted there for on three our. Three hours and doing nothing. You're going to be taking posted naps. Posted a comment on our Facebook today, and it was it was uh, um, God's, God's masterpiece or God's painting or something uh, like that. And I think it's really true. Anytime you're out there, especially sunrise and sunset, what what better place can you be than sitting in a duck line? Yeah. So um, I think that's about. We're going to probably wrap it up and. You know, as Ron and I always say, man, if you're going to go out this week, take one, teach one, and make sure you hunt hard. Yeah. Cool. Good. Thanks, guys. Yep.